Cherry Papini concocted an elaborate kidnapping story, but why? Was it for fame or fortune, or simply the behavior of someone suffering from severe mental health issues? Let's take a look at the untold truth of Sherry Papini. Sherry Papini disappeared six years ago, only to reappear 22 days later. This started a years-long investigation into the strange details of her alleged abduction. Long after Sherry Papini returned home, detectives continued to investigate but reported no new developments. As the public waited for an arrest, a lull overtook the investigation. Naturally, rumors began percolating and people began casting doubt on Papini's story. During this time, a series of incident reports from the Shasta County Sheriff's Office dating back from 2000 to 2003 were discovered by the Sacramento Bee. Notably, Papini's family made several calls to law enforcement about her. Papini's father, Richard Graff, claimed that she burglarized his home, and a few years later, he alleged she made unauthorized withdrawals from his bank account. In another report, Loretta Graff, Sherry's mother, claimed that Papini was hurting herself and then attributing the injuries to her. A deputy responded to Graff with advice on how to handle the situation. Papini's sister, Sheila Coaster, also reported her to the police. The back door of her home had been vandalized, and Coaster believed that Papini was responsible. In a statement, Papini's family called the Sacramento Bee's reporting on Papini's trouble shameful and called the article clickbait. Sherry Papini had a previous husband before she met Keith Papini, but it was a marriage that started for all the wrong reasons. According to the official criminal complaint filed against her, Papini married Platoon Sergeant David Dreyfus in 2006 and used his military status to obtain health insurance. Dreyfus told investigators that Papini made regular egg donations, which caused health problems, and they managed to marry before he was deployed overseas. Although Papini's mother claimed the couple traveled the world together, Dreyfus said they only met once in Japan and never lived together. While still married to Dreyfus, Papini reconnected with middle school crush Keith, who she had shared her first kiss with. In a 2009 wedding blog post, Papini wrote, I never imagined my middle school first kiss would turn out to be my husband. In her post, Papini described living with Keith in her townhouse in 2006 to test their compatibility before marriage. And when Dreyfus returned from his deployment, Papini informed him that she had met someone else. They divorced in 2008. Papini had once told Dreyfus that she was abused by her family growing up, but after their separation, Dreyfus learned from mutual friends that Papini had built up a reputation as a liar. She was faking a heart condition at one point, and eventually, like, not only me, but a bunch of people figured out that that was not true. On November 2, 2016, Sherry Papini went out for a jog near her home in Shasta County, California, and was last seen at 2 p.m. Her husband knew something was wrong when he realized that Papini had not retrieved their kids from daycare. 22 days later on Thanksgiving morning, Papini was found on the side of a highway 150 miles from her home, with a bag over her head and chains tied around her wrists and waist. Papini's miraculous return was fodder for national headlines, and her story soon captured attention around the globe. Days after her return, national media outlets like Good Morning America and ABC's 2020 flanked Redding, California to interview the Papini family and cover the story. People were enraptured by Papini's story because of her safe return, which is rare in abduction cases. But there were also inconsistencies in Papini's recollection, spurring conspiracies and hoax rumors. On one occasion, Papini said she fought against one of her abductors, resulting in a cut on her foot, but her hospital photos showed no evidence of that injury. Adding to the confusion was the slow progress of both the investigation and the release of new information. Sherry Papini returned home with a detailed, harrowing accounting of her kidnapping. She said her abductors were two Hispanic women who spoke mostly Spanish and forced her into their vehicle at gunpoint. She was then supposedly kept hostage in a closet, where she was chained to a pole. The windows were boarded up and her environment was very cold. According to her interview with investigators, Papini's captors listened to really annoying Mexican music and spent time watching TV. She was fed only once a day. Her meals consisted of rice, tortillas, and apples. Papini managed to fight back at one point when she was allowed to leave her closet to take a shower, slamming the head of one of her captors onto the toilet. Her captivity ended after Papini heard her captors arguing, followed by a gunshot. The younger captor took Papini and dropped her off on a highway. Papini came back home with a swollen nose and bruises, rashes, and ligature marks all over her body. She was also branded on her right shoulder with unintelligible markings, which detectives struggled to decipher. She also weighed 13 pounds lighter and had her long blonde hair chopped off. It was only a matter of time before Sherry Papini's deception unraveled. In the spring of 2017, investigators found male DNA on the clothing and underwear she wore when she was discovered, but it wasn't until 2019 that the DNA was decoded. The following year, the DNA led them to Papini's ex-boyfriend, who was living in an apartment in Costa Mesa, California. The ex-boyfriend told investigators that Papini's story had been a lie. He helped her leave her home and drove her to his apartment. Papini told him that her husband Keith was abusive and she needed to escape. Papini's entire abduction was deliberately plotted. 
She and her ex-boyfriend contacted each other over prepaid phones to solidify their plans ahead of time. According to the criminal complaint filed against Papini, she and her ex-boyfriend started talking as early as December 2015. Once she arrived at her ex-boyfriend's home, she lived a comfortable life and never left the apartment. The ex-boyfriend bought her clothes at TJ Maxx, Target, and Ross, and she slept in a bedroom while her ex-boyfriend slept on a couch. As Thanksgiving neared, Papini said she missed her children and requested to be returned home. While staying at her ex-boyfriend's apartment, Sherry Papini began to create her story. She cut off her hair and gave herself injuries by bruising and burning her body. At times, she requested her ex-boyfriend's help. Although he refused to physically harm her, he agreed to brand her arm with a wood-burning tool he bought at Hobby Lobby. The ex-boyfriend told investigators that she would minimize how much food she ate, such as eating half a banana instead of a whole one in order to lose weight. He told his cousin that Papini had asked him to punch her in the face, but he refused. So she threw her body on the bathroom floor and against the bathtub to injure herself. According to the criminal complaint, the entire experience left the ex-boyfriend rattled. In an interview with law enforcement, Papini described the table she was tied to as she was being branded by her abductors. That description fits a table found at the ex-boyfriend's apartment. Further, the closet in the bedroom she stayed in had the same lag bolt that she described in her hostage narrative. Sherry Papini's supposed abduction eerily mirrored the disappearance of a former classmate of hers back in 1998. 16-year-old Tara Smith was the homecoming queen at Central Valley High School and only a year apart from Papini. She had gone out jogging on Old Oregon Trail, the same road Papini disappeared from in the early evening of August 22, 1998. 18 years later, when Papini disappeared, her grieving family reached out to Smith's father, Terry, for advice. Their daughters were now both victims of a similar crime. When she returned home, Papini spoke to the family and dined with them. Papini's arrest and the disclosure of her fabrication were disconcerting for Tara's mother, Sierra who said Papini had to be sick and not well to make up such a lie. She called Papini's situation upsetting, which made it difficult for her to sympathize. On August 13, 2020, suspecting that Sherry Papini had invented everything, law enforcement warned her of the consequences of lying to federal agents. According to the district attorney's press release of her arrest, a Shasta County detective and a federal agent presented Papini with evidence that she hadn't been abducted, but Papini refused to recant her carefully constructed narrative. In the interview with her husband, Keith Present, Papini recounted descriptions of her supposed abductors. The investigators presented her with a lineup of Hispanic women, but Papini recognized none of them. They then presented her with several pictures of her ex-boyfriend's apartment, with several rooms and objects that matched her prior descriptions. She claimed she recognized none of it. When given a picture of his bathroom, she denied it was the same one, saying there was a crack in the tile where she was held captive. The investigators then presented her with a photo of the tile crack in her ex-boyfriend's bathroom, but Papini still denied everything. It wasn't until her husband left the room that Papini admitted that she had been in contact with her ex-boyfriend, but she still maintained that she was abducted by two Hispanic women. Cherry Papini's claims that Hispanic women were behind her kidnapping emboldened doubters. An old blog post written in 2007 on the now inoperative website Skinheads began circulating online since it was authored by someone named Sherry Greff, Papini's maiden name. In the post, Greff describes being attacked by a group of Latinos who called her father a Nazi. Greff then described herself heroically fighting the group, whose main gripe against Greff was that she was drug-free, white, and proud of my blood and heritage. According to the criminal complaint, the post originally appeared on a MySpace page. The Shasta County detectives confronted Papini about the post, and she told them she had previously hired an attorney to try to get it removed. She called the post awful and believed someone else had written it under her name. Sherry Papini's fake kidnapping cost the California Victims' Compensation Board over $30,000 in assistance money, which went toward her therapy sessions, blinds, and her ambulance trip to the hospital. Papini applied for the money on November 28, 2016, a few days after she returned home. She answered the program's questionnaire and detailed her kidnapping under penalty of perjury. She was awarded 35 payments from January 2017 to March 2021. To make matters worse, Papini used her family's crowdsourced funds from their GoFundMe campaign to pay off her credit card debt. On November 4, 2016, two days after she disappeared, a family friend created the campaign Help Find Sherry Papini. The campaign's page promised that all funds would be used for search efforts to bring her home safely by any means necessary. They managed to raise $49,070. On December 6, 2016, several days after Papini returned, her husband transferred $31,818 to his and Papini's personal bank accounts, which were then used for credit card debts and personal expenses. So many people, so many resources, so, so much financial burden uh, was put out to find this young lady. After a long investigation, it was time to bring Papini in. Law enforcement and officials followed Papini from her home to her children's music lesson. 
To separate Papini physically from her children and protect them in case her arrest resulted in gunfire, Papini was told there was an accident involving her car so she would come out alone. Once she was outside, an FBI agent told her she was under arrest, to which Papini yelled no, ran away, and threw her phone 20 feet away. Papini didn't manage to escape and was brought into custody. As a defense for resisting arrest, Papini's attorney said she was merely caught by surprise and was instinctively trying to protect her children, who were nearby watching. Shortly after, Papini was released on a $120,000 bond on the conditions of surrendering her passports, refraining from alcohol, and providing a DNA sample. She also had to seek psychiatric treatment. On Monday, April 18, 2022, Sherry Papini pleaded guilty to charges of mail fraud and making false statements to a federal agent. She claimed that she was ashamed of her behavior and promised to embark on a lifelong mission to compensate for it. In her court appearance, Papini revealed that she had been in treatment for anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder since 2016. She faced a maximum sentence of 25 years in prison and up to $500,000 in fines. In addition to fines, Papini would have to pay restitution to the various establishments that helped solve her fake kidnapping. Once convicted, she owed $127,000 to the U.S. Social Security Administration, $148,866 to the Shasta County Sheriff's Office, and $2,558 to the FBI. And it's just a complete farce for law enforcement and for the nation. Papini signed a plea agreement on April 13th of 2022 that allowed her to receive the mildest possible punishment. According to former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, Papini is likely to receive a sentence of eight months in federal prison and no significant fines. If you or someone you know is dealing with domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also find more information, resources, and support at their website.